I'm Robert Strand, the Executive Director of the Center for Responsible Business here at Berkeley Haas. The mission of the Center for Responsible Business is to develop leaders who redefine business for a sustainable future. And one significant way that we put this mission in practice is this, through our Peterson Speaker Series. Uh, it's our flagship speaker series through which we convene uh, business innovators, forward-thinking academics, distinguished leaders, students to discuss critical issues uh, that are important to help move us toward a sustainable future. Today's discussion is focused on partnering with communities, inclusive innovation in the on-demand economy. We have phenomenal experts here to engage with us in this expansive topic, and I will leave the task to properly introduce them all to my good colleague, uh, Greg, here, Greg Nelson. As many of you know, this past year, Haas completed a new strategic business plan uh, in, to help guide our school over the next five years. And a key strategy within this plan was to leverage our Bay Area location to engage with innovative companies with whom our students also desire increased engagement. And I think it's very safe to say that we're achieving that here today with, uh, with Airbnb and, and Lyft as, uh, as, as featured companies. And I would like to ask, just a show of hands, who are students in this room? And now, show of hands, who of you are interested in companies uh, such as Airbnb and Lyft for potential employment? Okay, so watch out <laughs> afterwards. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, I'm also thrilled to say today's event is co-sponsored by the Aspen Institute's Future of Work Initiative, which is a year-long nonpartisan effort to identify concrete ways to strengthen the social contract in the midst of sweeping changes in today's workforce and workplace. And additionally, our very own Professor Laura Tyson has kindly agreed to uh, contribute to today's discussions, offer a few uh, reflection remarks, and, and Laura, we asked you to do this because you are so good at it. Uh, and, well, and I'm not just saying that because you do do my performance review. That's, that's very sincere. So we will have a good conversation, we'll have some question and answers, and then, and then we'll ask Professor Tyson to offer a few remarks. Uh, on, on your reflections on maybe some things that struck you from today's conversation. Uh, before I turn it over to Greg to uh, kick off today's discussions, I ask that you fill out the surveys uh, that you are probably sitting on right now. Uh, that's very important feedback that we, we want to receive. And also please note that today is, is a sustainable event. Everything is compostable. Greg, it's Perfect. all yours. All right. Please, uh, everyone, a warm welcome to our, to our right. panel. Terrific. Uh, well, thanks everybody. Thanks for, for coming out today. We we're incredibly excited about the chance to um, uh, have a good discussion with you guys and have had the chance to um, sit down with the, the four of us and Robert to um, talk a bit about what we thought would be um, most helpful for this discussion. Um, let me start by just doing a very quick introduction, then I'll, I'll set up um, some with, uh, with some data and some definitions, some of the discussion, and then we're going to jump right in with our panelists. So. Um, so I'm Greg Nelson. Uh, I uh, moved back to the Bay Area last fall after um, seven years in, in Washington, D.C. Most of that was with the uh, White House economic team where I had a good chance to work with, uh, with Dr. Tyson on the President's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness and a range of other issues. Um, one of my favorite things I got to do in, in, that, um, in that time was work on kind of emerging economic issues in the sharing economy and, and particularly looking at platform companies was a part of it, um, as I think you'll hear from today and as you've experienced around you here in the Bay Area. Um, the emerging online platforms have created some real challenges for uh, policymakers in thinking about how to treat uh, and understand the, um, all sides of, the, of these multi-sided platforms and what it means for, for employers, for workers, for users, for, uh, for customers, um, and how we can all continue to uh, benefit from their incredible opportunities um, and also make sure that it's consistent with the values that each community uh, decides that, uh, that they, they hold dear. So that's what we're really hoping to get into today is to dive into that, that interaction a bit. Um, we have an incredible group uh, with us. So I'll just briefly give you their names and then we're gonna come back to them with, a, with an opening question. Um, Libby Reeder is with us from the Aspen Institute's Future of Work Initiative. Uh, Libby is a proud Haas alum. Woo! Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and spent um, much of her career prior to this working in, in CSR for some of the, the biggest brand names here in the Bay Area uh, and, across, and across the globe, really, even eBay uh, and Visa in particular. So we'll get a chance to pick Libby's brain about that. Um, sitting next to Libby is Kati Schmidt, who is a uh, senior partnerships manager for Glo Airbnb's global public policy team. Um, she was describing earlier being one of the first two people in Airbnb's policy team. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've certainly learned in talking to folks uh, in this space is that the pace with which the 
the, um, the scaling of the company and the new markets that they're going into uh, greatly outpaces the, uh, the, the pace with which they're uh, hiring up policy staff. So if you were Kadi and it was five years ago, um, that meant you were probably covering two thirds of the world uh, around, around uh, policy and all the issues that were, that were coming up. So she has some great war stories that she's gonna share with us today. And then uh, next to Kadi, Mike Masterman, um, who is uh, one of the senior folks in the policy team at Lyft and my former colleague um, in the Obama administration, um, Mike, uh, Mike covers both domestic and international issues for Lyft on policy and is somebody that we've worked very closely with in thinking about some of the, um, the emerging issues in particular in the, in the um, ride sharing space. So uh, to follow uh, uh, Robert's guidance, anybody here utilized a, um, a home sharing service like Airbnb before, either as a user, customer, or putting your home there? Pretty much everybody. What about uh, ride sharing uh, using Lyft or Uber or any of the other services? Great, all right, so as customers, I think everybody's pretty familiar with uh, with, uh, with how these, these um, platforms work. Um, but I thought we'd start with a couple of very quick um, definitions and then a little bit of data about what are we actually seeing across the economy. We're in a bit of a, uh, of a, of a healthy bubble here in the Bay Area um, uh, for adoption, but also this, this is obviously something that's progressing very rapidly across the country and across the globe. Um, so for the definition side, you know, Libby and I have been looking at this um, uh, uh, broadly. People have referred to this as the gig economy, the on-demand economy, the online platform economy, the patchwork economy, and, and the sharing economy. And all of those have various elements of truth in them. Um, the great distinction uh, um, that I think is important for us today is thinking about the difference between labor platforms and capital platforms. And I'm stealing this distinction from uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute has done a recent survey on this. So um, one way to think about it is that uh, Mike and, and his team at Lyft, along with Handy, TaskRabbit, Uber, Others are, are, are really labor platforms that what you're um, utilizing the service for is to connect you with somebody who's gonna um, perform um, a labor-oriented service for you, whether that's coming in and installing uh, your IKEA furniture or hitching a ride um, downtown to, to grab a drink. On the capital flat platforms, it's uh, utilizing um, existing assets that you have or something, a creative product that you're building. So I think of that as more like Airbnb or Etsy or eBay or some of the, the um, platforms where there is a more of a good exchange um, uh, for, uh, for, um, for, 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 uh, for money. Um, a little bit on the data side, and this again comes from J.P. Morgan Chase as well as some recent research from um, Alan Kruger uh, and Intuit. Um, when we look at broadly across the economy, uh, which is that shows that pretty regularly um, and, and growing very rapidly, about 1% of uh, adults participate month to month um, in earning income from these platforms. Again, using looking at both capital and labor platforms, so it's um, a uh, fairly significant portion of the economy and growing rapidly. Um, about 4.2% of adults have participated at some point, so you see a lot of people who come in and do um, uh, irregular but important um, uh, income earning opportunities in, in these platforms. Um, and incredibly fast growth. We've seen um, uh, doubling as a percentage of the labor force each year for the last four years, um, in particular uh, in the, in the um, labor market uh, platforms, which have been increasing very rapidly. And that, if anything, we've seen maybe a little tightening of that as the labor market itself has tightened and unemployment has come down, uh, but, uh, but still an incredibly rapid uh, uh, growth. Um, and that people are using it primarily as a second source of income. Uh, for the labor platforms, um, only about 25%, um, and this is across the board, so maybe may not apply directly to, to Lyft, but um, for the whole category, about 25% of labor platforms um, are earning more than, or people are earning more than 75% of their total income from, from that platform. So 75% of the folks are using it um, as more supplemental income. Uh, and then for the capital platforms, only about 17% of folks uh, are earning more than 75% of their income uh, from, from those platforms. Um, and interestingly enough, um, at least from this data, most folks are still earning from only one platform. The, there's sort of a commonly held perception, maybe people are um, driving for Uber and for Lyft and they're also making deliveries for Instacart and um, sharing their home on Airbnb. Um, that may be happening here uh, in San Francisco. We may, we may all know people that are doing all of that, but it, as, it, as it is growing, at least at this case, um, uh, most of the people who are earning income off these platforms are still doing it um, on primarily one platform month to month. Um, and then the last um, uh, statistic I'll throw at you is that participation is often sporadic. So only about 56% of folks participate in labor platforms after their, their first month as a primary source of income. So a lot of people trying it out, seeing if it can be something that's supplemental to uh, where, wherever else they may be earning income, and then utilizing it in strategic places um, to, uh, to, be, to be another uh, supplemental source. Um, and I think what's exciting for us from the policy side is 
that while, um, while, while um, small compared to some other parts of the economy, it's growing so rapidly, and the trends that we're seeing in these markets um, are things that are, that are both building on other trends, um, uh, like the, great, the significant increase in contingent workers across the economy, but also accelerating some of those because of the ease of which um, the exchange between um, work and, uh, and finding customers can be done. So um, just a little bit to, to set us up for how we can jump into the rest of today. And with that, let's, uh, let's get rolling. So I've got an opening uh, question for each of the panelists to try to help us get to know them a little bit better. Um, so Mike, uh, in your role, I know this because I occasionally try to get in touch with you, uh, you are a, uh, a road warrior uh, and have been, uh, although technically based in San Francisco, probably been um, in, uh, in more than half the states in the country in the last year and a half, uh, and, uh, and some internationally as well. Um, and you've seen uh, cities have a lot of um, differences in how they approach the sharing economy and, and Lyft in particular. Um, some kind of closing their eyes and ignoring it, hoping that they don't have to deal with it very, very, uh, very soon. Some with wide open arms and some folks who, um, who have a lot more caution in how they've, they've met you guys. Um, anything in that that has surprised you and, and kind of what lessons would you take away from it? And then um, if we have a moment, also share with us just kind of one story about the um, re emerging relationship with Lyft and cities. Sure. So uh, <clears throat> first off, thank you. This is great. Uh, so I think, you know, taking a step back, first of all, change is very hard, right, in any context. Change plus regulation becomes even harder, right? Change plus regulation plus transportation is incredibly complex because a lot of these cities haven't changed their transportation regs in like 30 to 40, sometimes even 50 years. Right? And they never anticipated that you'd be pushing a button and a stranger would come and pick you up and that's the way people would be moving around their cities. Right? I mean, if you asked me five years ago if that's the way that me and all my friends would be getting around a city, I would have told you you're crazy. Right? But the reality is that's what we're doing. Right? And it runs counter to the whole idea that our parents taught us, right? never get into a car with a stranger. And now you're a policy official and you're supposed to regulate that. Right? So that, I think, was something that coming into this role it's been really difficult for policymakers to think about how can you think about this brand new industry instead of trying to level the playing field, how can you create an entirely new playing field for ride sharing, which is clearly now part of the transportation ecosystem. I think something that's been really complicated for a lot of policymakers and regulators is that it's really easy for an elected official to stand up and say like, I embrace entrepreneurship, we love innovation, we harness innovation. It's a lot harder than when you have entrenched incumbents who are yelling, screaming, politically powerful, and then the policymakers and regulators have to figure out how to deal with that while crafting a new set of regulations. What, what I found to be surprising in this is that certain cities where you think would be forward-leaning, cities like Seattle or Austin, have actually been some of the hardest cities to do business in. Whereas other cities, like a city like Nashville, which is really trying to redefine itself, Nashville was the first city to create a set of regulations that allowed us to operate at the airport. The first city in America, which I found to be astonishing. Um, whereas other cities where you think, like Seattle, home of Microsoft and Amazon, Seattle's been an incredibly hard city for us to do business in. Um, and I think the last thing is, with an eye towards the future, you know, a lot of the, the, the cities are, are thinking about what does it mean to, to do transit planning? What does it mean for an entity like ride sharing to be part of the city? I know we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but look, self-driving cars and that future is right around the corner, right? We did this deal with GM, and part of that deal with GM was the idea that the initial self-driving car is gonna be incredibly expensive, right? Very few people are gonna be able to buy their own self-driving car. But with a network like Lyft and an entity like GM, you could have Chevy Bolts all across a city like San Francisco, right, as soon as they're made. The challenge is gonna be, like, if you go to Market Street right now, Market Street's like crazy. Right, you've got the bike lane, the pedestrian lane, a car lane, a bus lane, a taxi lane. Like, what's gonna happen when we have self-driving cars? And that is coming sooner than we think. And so all the challenges I think we've had with cities and elected officials and policymakers, like the learnings that we're taking from ride sharing, I think are gonna be even more complicated when we think about self-driving cars. So you're saying we're, we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, look, I think we're just getting started. And I think one of the things I'm also surprised by yeah. was like the cultural shift, right? Yeah. So Logan Green, our CEO, spent a summer in Zimbabwe. And in Zimbabwe, like everyone was ride sharing. Right? They don't have public transit. They didn't have a taxi system. People were ride sharing out of necessity. And it was something people have been doing, frankly, in places like Cuba and all other parts of the world. We just hadn't done it in North America. But we've seen this shift now, right? Like 
people are just doing it. And it's happened a lot quicker, I think, than people anticipated. I think the same thing is going to be applied to self-driving yeah, cars. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thanks, Mike. Kylie, let's turn to you for uh, um, uh, some reflection. Uh, you first worked with Airbnb. Uh, obviously, we, we mentioned on kind of the international team uh, coming in and covering a lot of the emerging markets, the new markets you were opening. Um, about cities in particular, how whether you notice any differences between how cities um, overseas approach these types of issues compared to here, and are there any lessons that we should be thinking about um, importing uh, into uh, the U.S. market as well? Yeah, uh, Airbnb is in 191 countries, which means we have uh, hosts in all these countries, and as of today, we also have offices in a few of these markets. Uh, we do look at best practices. Um, we've made some progress, and we actually import them back to, to this area, but also share out. So I would say there are best practices uh, overseas in Europe, but also uh, luckily here in the US. Um, but I want to share European examples, because yeah. uh, that's uh, where I started to work for four years. Um, and most recently, actually, the, the UK on a national level um, has announced that they want to be a leader in the sharing economy. Um, and that means they want to look at how to measure and track the impact of the sharing economy and include it within their GDP, um, which is a huge acknowledgement. And also, they want to make it easy for people to be part of the sharing economy and have um, granted a tax-free uh, income level of 1,000 pounds, which means if you're under this, this uh, threshold, you don't have to fill in forums, it reduces bureaucracy, um, and you don't have to pay taxes on this amount. Um, another example where Airbnb maybe has worked closer with the city in a real partnership um, was Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, very, very pragmatic approach. Uh, we have signed an MOU with the city, um, initially just for one year as a pilot to try it out if it works, um, and then really sat down with leaders in the city. And um, Amsterdam is a small city. It has already a lot of tourists. Um, but then we decided Airbnb could maybe help um, spread the tourism also to neighborhoods where tourists usually are not going to support hosts there in, in those neighborhoods. Um, and then not only the hosts, but actually also the, all the local businesses, like the favorite restaurants and stores of, of our hosts in Amsterdam. Um, but then also the city had valid concerns. Uh, so together with Airbnb, they've kind of created their own um, home sharing website um, on the city pages um, with uh, <coughs> FAQs, do's and don'ts, guidelines, tips, um, and they've even printed brochures and like have postcards with a little coffee mug on it, like just to remember hosts, like before you start hosting, you may want to talk to your neighbor. And those are things that um, they worked really well in Amsterdam, so they've recently renewed the MOU with us. Um, but we're also sharing those best practices uh, when we meet other city leaders. Um, but there are examples here in the Bay Area too. Um, I think for cities it, it makes a lot of sense if they host uh, big events uh, like the Super Bowl. Um, we've talked to the, city, um, the Super Bowl in Santa Clara, we've talked to San Jose through the mayor actually. How can our hosts help be good ambassadors and also help with infrastructure? How can we make sure the locals here participate from this uh, extra tourism and, and the benefits it brings? Yeah, that's great. Um, Libby? Uh, as, we, as we talked about, you've had a career in CSR, places like eBay and Visa, um, and are now working with the Aspen Institute uh, for the Future of Work. Um, tell us a little bit about what that is attempting to, to, uh, to uh, um, explore. Um, and then I'm curious, you guys have been working on it for about six months, sort of what the, the kind of pace of change looks like for uh, even this part of the, the um, policy side of the sharing economy. Sure. Um, so first of all, thanks so much to Dr. Strand of the Center for Responsible Business and to Dr. Tyson for keeping this conversation uh, very much alive here at Berkeley. It's great to be back. Um, I, as advertised, I'm a, a proud alum and will be coming back to celebrate my 10th reunion in a few weeks, which is as shocking as it is exciting. Um, there's nowhere I'd rather be this afternoon than back here except for possibly at the Giants home opener. So uh, let's, let's, let's hope those guys are, are doing a good job today. Um, so at the Aspen Institute uh, Future of Work Initiative, we're really taking a look at this issue through the lens of the future of work, as, as, as it says on the, on the door. Um, we look at cities as a place where a lot of people come to work, um, where a lot of people live in order to be close to their work. And you know what we see right now is that the nature of work in the United States is really changing. 
um, you know, we, we have moved away from a paradigm of work of yesteryear where a single person had a single employer and a single career um, through, their, through their life. Um, and now we're in a world where most people have multiple employers through their lives, often at the exact same time. You know, many people are earning income from multiple sources at once. And we also see less full-time work. So um, the, the Harvard, and, uh, Harvard economists and Princeton economists that published research last week found that over the 10 years between 2005 and 2015, uh, the growth in employment was almost entirely attributable to contingent work, so non-full-time work arrangements. Um, so that's a, that signals a seismic shift. And that's important because it means that we are seeing a change in the relationship between people who earn income and the companies that provide that income. And that's particularly important here in the United States because here we have actually knit our social safety net between the workers and the companies. And as that relationship shifts, the, the safety net starts to fray. And it forces us to, to start to think about what does that mean for individuals? What does it mean for retirement? What does it mean for an individual family's ability to weather economic shocks? Um, and what does it mean for the economy as a whole? Does it put greater pressure on government programs as a backstop if more people are doing contingent work and, and don't have access to the, the, safe, the social safety net? So broadly, the Future of Work Initiative is really focused on that question across the economy. Um, you know, including questions like, what does that mean for capitalism? Is that a critique of capitalism? Do we need to start to, to rethink through, through policy and otherwise how we can create incentives for company to value labor um, again in the United States? Um, and then specifically, because the on-demand economy has been such a charismatic example of, of this trend, this shift in the, in the employment market, you know, we need to understand what's going on in the on-demand economy and think about how, that, how those social safety net questions pertain to some of the people who are earning income in that economy. So we're focused on two things, really. We're focused on data, so really sizing and understanding the on-demand economy. I would say that you know, of the, the data that Greg cited, um, all of it has been released in the last six months. So we are not talking about sort of a, a rich tradition of measurement uh, of this sector of the economy, and I think uh, smart research researchers would violently agree that we need more and that it needs to be done um, in a more savvy way. Um, so we're working to advance that agenda. We're also looking at, you know, once we do understand what's going on, what are some of the, the solutions, the policy solutions that we could take a look at that might help to, to sort of capture uh, more people in that net uh, moving forward. So I, I think on that front, we really look at cities as a great laboratory for where we can start to test out some of these ideas um, and advance them. Obviously, there's very little that's been done at a federal level that hasn't been done at a city or state level first. Um, so this is a really important conversation and we're glad to be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Exactly. I thought it was construction. I scattered a bunch of nuts up there, so no, no surprise that the squirrels are running around. Um, great. Well, let's, let's um, uh, tackle some of the headline issues and some of the questions that um, students want to make sure we addressed uh, uh, today and that are, I know are top of mind for both of you and, and, and your companies. Um, things like treatment of workers, affordable housing, competition with incumbent industries that, that Mike mentioned. And our goal is not to rehash these issues, but to try to dig in a bit more and get an understanding of, of how you as a company approach them and why they're, why they're so important. Um, I wanted to start with the questions around labor and treatment of workers. Libby, maybe you could frame it up for us and then um, let's go to Mike and talk about some of the ways that, that Lyft is approaching your partnership with drivers. Sure. So I will um, beg the forgiveness of any law students in the room. I'm not a lawyer and certainly not an employment lawyer, but um, a lot of what we're talking about when we're thinking about workers in the on-demand economy is sort of a, a separation of two types of work relationships. That's um, employee and independent contractor. So in shorthand, they're often defined in terms of the tax form that those types of individuals use. So W-2 for, for an employee and uh, a 1099, Form 1099, for people who are operating as independent contractors. And I'm not gonna bore you with the, the IRS's 20-factor test for how they decide <laughs> which is which, and I might have, a, have trouble recalling all of them, but the, the sort of overarching principle is the degree to which uh, the income provider or company has control over uh, the, the type of work, what work is done, and when it's done, and how. Um, 
So you know, within the on-demand economy, um, different people, different, different platforms have made different decisions for very good business reasons about what type of work relationship they want to have with their workforce. So as an example, you know, Uber as a company has decided on a, a has, has pursued a 1099 relationship with its drivers. Um, another company like Honor, which is a home healthcare uh, company, they have recently made the decision to shift over from 1099 to W-2. And they had a variety of business reasons to, to make that, that decision. And then there's, there are others who are pursuing interesting models like Instacart. So Instacart has actually decided on a hybrid model where the people who are doing the shopping inside the stores, the stores have been offered the opportunity to convert to a w, W-2. And the people who do the driving, the delivery of the groceries, those people still operate as 1099 independent contractors. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of um, advantages from the worker side to working on a 1099 basis. People cite flexibility usually most principally as the thing that they enjoy. Um, but I think nobody would disagree that a 1099 relationship also shifts a lot of responsibility and obligation um, onto the shoulders of the individual. So if you've worked as a W-2 employee at a company, maybe you've had things like you've your company has done tax withholding for you so that you don't get surprised by a big tax bill. Um, and maybe your company has contributed to a retirement account on your behalf. Um, those are all things that sort of don't exist in the construct of the independent contractor today. Um, so, you know, workers have sort of a variety of opinions about the, the different work arrangements. Companies also, you know, have, have made different decisions and have a, a range of thoughts about the positives and negatives of the different work arrangements. I think you know, businesses and, and by extension their investors, we've, we've heard increasingly that, that there's maybe a little, a little bit of a shift going on um, from sort of the, the, the businesses favoring the, the 1099 to businesses starting to shift toward a W-2. Um, you know, we've heard from some venture capitalists, for example, that um, they now will say, in, if a, a startup entrepreneur comes to them with a business plan centered around a 1099 model, they'll come back and say, um, you know, I'd prefer to see this business plan with W-2s, in part because they just want the certainty. Um, we're in a moment of, of uh, a lot of litigation and uh, sort of questions around um, classification. And, you know, I think we, we are trying to figure out whether those, um, whether dis the descriptions of the work relationships that exist are accurate. Um, some have proposed a third classification for workers. So um, sort of in, in the midst of this discussion, we are hearing calls for a, a, an independent worker or a dependent contractor, sort of a third way to classify workers that don't exactly feel like they fit in either, um, either bucket. But I think really the, the broader question here is whether, you know, whether, when, and, or how are we going to update our social safety net um, to reflect the fact that there is so much more work today being done on an independent or contingent basis. And you know, once we get through some resolving some of the questions around just sort of the, are they, you know, are they X or are they Y, behind that there's actually a much more important and fundamental and unfortunately bigger and hairier conversation that we're gonna have to wrestle with um, as a society. So Mike, Mike, you guys have you know, tens of thousands of uh, drivers using Lyft to earn income across the country, and obviously this is a conversation you've had quite a bit internally and spent a lot of time surveying your drivers and understanding what's, what's important for them. Maybe you could talk about the, like how you guys approach it and, and some of the feedback you've heard from drivers as well. Sure. Uh, I think, look, first off, it's important to understand the Lyft vision, right? The Lyft vision is that everyone is on a Lyft-like platform, right? Giving rides, getting rides, so that you can make a decision as to whether or not you actually need a car, and if you have a car, you're sharing the seats in the car, right? So I'm a Lyft driver. I did it because we've got this cool thing called driver destination mode where you can enter in, enter in your at the address you're going and you can pick people up five minutes around where you are and five minutes around where you're going. And last week we just launched Lyft Carpool, which is actually really focused on people who are doing the commute down the 101, right? So the cultural shift we talked about first, it was like, will I get into a car with a stranger? The next one is like, will everyone start picking up strangers? Which is tough, right? I'm from Southern California. Like I grew up sitting in my car by myself like, am I gonna pick up strangers along the way? I don't know, but our idea is that we'll reach this cultural shift. I think it's important to understand the demographics of our drivers, right? So 80% of our drivers are doing this 10 to 15 hours a week, right? Very much on a casual basis 
in San Francisco, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, we have a lot of students, maybe we even have some Haas students who are Lyft drivers. Um, but look, these are people doing it on a casual basis. And during the course of, of this litigation, what we found out actually was that only one half of 1% of our drivers over a two-year period of time were doing this like, quote, full-time, meaning more than 30 hours a week for a period of six months or more. So, so we know that people are doing this you know, as means of supplemental income. That being said, look, this is a complicated question. And what we want to do is make sure that while people are on the Lyft platform, we're treating them as best as possible. So we have partnerships with Intuit to help them with taxes. Right? We did blast emails about the ACA. We partnered with Enroll America to make sure that our drivers knew about healthcare options. We partnered with an entity called Honest Dollar, which is a company that helps independent contractors with retirement and savings plans. We've got gas cards. We've got perks with Verizon. The idea for us is that, look, we know that being a Lyft driver isn't necessarily your dream, but while you're using Lyft as a bridge towards your dream, like we're going we're gonna to treat you in a great, humane way. Uh, and that's also why we, frankly, were involved with Libby and Greg and, and a group of academics and Dr. Tyson and think tanks and other industry leaders who signed on to this, this letter of principles around flexibility and stability, acknowledging that the world is changing. Um, and there are people who are utilizing these online platforms um, you know, as sources of income. And so what can we do as sort of thought leaders in this space to have a meaningful conversation, to figure out what the onus is on the private sector industry, what the onus is on workers, and what the onus is on government. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Um, Katia, I want to touch on housing, um, which is, for anybody who lives in the Bay Area, is obviously a big issue. Uh, availability, affordability, all of those pieces. Um, uh, and they're, as I mentioned, particularly acute here. Um, how do you guys approach those questions? And I know the big part of Airbnb's approach has been to, um, to uh, look at the map and understand you're going to be in the neighborhoods and be in um, places where um, uh, guests and tourists and business uh, uh, travelers aren't traditionally. Um, and what, how do you view that impact and how do you think about the, the impact on affordability and accessibility? Airbnb actually started in the housing crisis and it started in this one in San Francisco. So our founders, uh, Brian and Joe, uh, were roommates and they couldn't afford rent. Um, and there was a huge conference, another big event in San Francisco, and hotels were not affordable for everyone. Um, so they came up with their own clever idea and were able um, to post a, a blog um, to host three strangers on air mattresses, air beds, in their living room, just to make one month of rent for one during one weekend. Um, and they posted a blog, the air bed and bed and breakfast, um, and uh, got applications from actually all around the world, and not only from young hipsters, but actually from people that were a lot older than Joe and Brian eight years ago. Uh, and they were surprised. Um, so they kind of tapped into something um, during the crisis, um, economic crisis, housing crisis, um, and, and they realized it works for both sides. It works for hosts who are trying to make ends meet, who are trying to pay their bill, who are trying to pay their rent, uh, but it also works for travelers who are, uh, can't always afford um, hotels with surge pricing uh, during big events, um, and this combination worked, and then slowly um, they rolled this out um, globally through other events. Uh, so actually, Airbnb, I think, is here because of the housing crisis. Um, and now um, we're actually looking, as we've grown, uh, we're looking to try to understand uh, our portfolio better. Um, on Airbnb, you can rent a lot of rooms and shared spaces, but you can also rent entire apartments. Um, how many listings does a host have? Um, and we made a promise uh, that we actually um, published last year, I have it here with me, it's a pledge for cities to be good for cities. Um, and this actually is called the Airbnb Community Impact, and it has three pillars. The first pillar is we want to pay um, our fair share of taxes, which means we want to help hosts um, collect and remit tourist tax. In a lot of places this means cities have actually to change the tourist tax laws for us uh, to be able to do so. Um, the second part is transparency. I think there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of question marks in the air, there's confusions. Um, so like, what is it that Airbnb does? How often do hosts host? Um, how big is their space? Do they use it themselves? Which means a lot of surveys and a lot of tracking 
and then um, sharing this data with cities on an anonymous aggregated level for them to understand the impact as well, including the impact on the neighborhoods. Where are those listings and when are people staying and how many people staying in those areas? Um, and the third one is um, if there's a city like San Francisco, but also New York or Berlin, um, where there might be actual housing shortage and there hasn't been enough investment in building new housing and the cities are still so attractive for for new people to move in. Um, so even if you were to start a building program, you probably couldn't keep up with it. Um, what is the Airbnb impact um, on those markets and how can we help the cities solve that? Um, and that is our promise to cities. And as part of that, we do data releases like last week in San Francisco and actually see the trend of education and working closely together with cities like San Francisco, like Amsterdam, um, on working on that, addressing it. Great. And, and I know that the data side, you guys have begun, in, as you do the release, also working with uh, city planners and the, and the housing departments. Um, Mike, you guys have been doing the same with public transit. Um, and I'm curious about how that relationship has, has developed and that I think I would assume um, that uh, they might see it as a threat to their ridership and the revenue that you know, public agencies need to, uh, to get from, um, from public transit. Um, and I noticed you guys have, you know, gone as far as putting, you know, the, the BART map on your advertising and seeing Lyft as an extension of that. Like, how does that coexist and you found places where there's real creativity? Right. So I think first there's a recognition among cities that there's, there's massive population growth, right? There's rapid urbanization and there's crumbling infrastructure. That's, that's a fact. That's a reality. It's not just a reality here in San Francisco. It's a reality all across the world, right? Traffic and congestion is very real and there's a real economic cost to it and transit and planning agencies are trying to think creatively about how to solve it. What we found here in San Francisco um, was that first off, we launched LiftLine. A year after we launched LiftLine, we found that 70% of people were using LiftLine, right, to get around, right, on the Lyft platform. That's one. Two, 20% of our rides were first and last mile rides, right? Rides to Caltram, rides to BART. For those of you who've commuted, right, there's small parking lots, not a lot, you know, it's a, it's a nightmare if you go there and the parking lot's full. So the first and last mile issue is one that's very real, and while ride sharing isn't the silver bullet solution, there's a recognition on the part of planning agencies that we can be part of the solution. So there was a shift from being somewhat contentious to actually thinking through how can we partner with ride sharing. If we have a limited budget, we are not necessarily gonna be able to increase the rail lines, we're not gonna be able to add more bus lines, how can ride sharing really be integrated into this transportation ecosystem? So we did deals with the Dallas area rapid transit. We did deals with BART and Caltran, who are now recognizing, I think one, that ride sharing is firmly like part of this ecosystem. It's not going anywhere, right? It's here and it's here to stay. So if it's here to stay, like BART users are gonna be using Lyft anyways, let's do a marketing partnership and let's integrate it into the apps. Let's come up with some real robust data sharing, which we're doing in places like LA, Right? So we're partnering with, with LA Metro and the LA Department of Transportation to understand how people are better moving around LA. And LA is actually a fascinating city. LA is where our CEO is from, Logan Green. In LA, if you go from 1.1 people per car to 1.3 people per car, there's no more traffic. Right? That's, I mean, look, that 0.2 is a pretty huge delta. <laughs> still, but it's a great little stat. It's a great little stat. And the second thing about LA is LA is, LA is an interesting city because it's a city built for cars. Right? Like LA is not a city built for people. So what do you do like, when you do have self-driving cars? What do you do with all those parking facilities that are just gonna be like, sitting there idle? How do you start thinking about cities in a way that like, you're, the lens is for people, it's not necessarily for cars? So I think that, that there's been this sort of recognition that through ride sharing with a look towards hopefully self-driving cars, there really are interesting creative ways to partner together. I love, I love having that. That problem would be a fun one to play with. <laughs> um, just, just as I was doing some research for, for, uh, for this panel, the, you know, the American Public Transit Asso Association, who is not someone I think in the early days was, yes. a, was a ride-sharing fan, um, came out with a study uh, uh, maybe a month ago. Yes. And the, the things that jumped out for me were that people who have, so they surveyed uh, public transit users and, and the general public, and what they found was people who have used Uber or Lyft own fewer cars than those who have not, which I thought was amazing. So about one, one car versus one and a half cars, so covering that spread you mentioned. And that people who use ride sharing also are more likely to regularly use public transit. So the like, integration between those two is, 
uh, you know, we learn a lot when we actually ask people what they do, and uh, it turns out that that integration has already started. Yeah, and look, the app to study, thank you for reminding me. Always rely on Greg Nelson to remind you of the really <laughs> important stats. Uh, look, the app to study was unbelievable, right? So there's this notion that it's a zero sum game, right? Like, oh my gosh, ride sharing is going to come to town, and like, no one's going to use transit anymore, and no one's going to ride taxis. It's actually like increasing the pie, right? So we know fewer and fewer people are buying cars, that's just a reality, right? Now what we're seeing and what I think the study illuminated is the fact that like when ride sharing comes to town, yeah, people are starting to rely on their cars less. And what they're doing is they're not just using ride sharing, they're using public transit, they're using bike sharing, they're using other forms of car sharing. So it's actually, it really actually is increasing the pie, which I think, um, you know, when it comes to, to folks in public transit, it gives them, I think, a lot more comfort to know that like, hey, maybe people are ride sharing to public transit or maybe using public transit and ride sharing home. I think it's a recognition that consumers in cities, they just want all these different options, right? We just want to be able to move around however we want to move around because one of the most interesting things about this job, I think, it's transportation is so personal, right? Like unless you're sitting at home all day, you have to move around, right? And how we choose to move around, like in taxis or in a bar or on a bike, like it's very personal, right? If you have a bad lift ride, like you're pissed off. Or if you're in a bad taxi, like you have this like real interesting response. Or if you're riding a bike and you know someone cuts you off, you like see someone slam on the hood. It's very personal, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, you know, I think that that Aptus study really did show though that for, from from a consumer perspective, ride sharing is uh, or hasn't actually eaten into that uh, that public yeah. transit ridership. So we're gonna ask, I'm going to ask one more question, then uh, um, open it up to, to you guys. So this is your cue to be thinking about your question you want to ask our panelists. Um, Kadi, uh, listening to Mike talk and, and some of the other conversation up here, it feels like there's this sort of uh, shared infrastructure that is, um, is kind of getting developed between communities. And um, a lot of it already existed in, in, in the housing stock, um, but the ability to access it um, becomes more uh, uh, readily available over time. Um, I was struck by one of the early examples from Airbnb as you guys kind of um, innovated your way into doing some of these things, and that was around Hurricane Sandy in New York and the um, use of home sharing as a supplemental um, uh, uh, um, housing for people who were uh, impacted by it. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And then I know you've, you guys have formalized that sort of resilience platform more, which is um, going back to Mike's old days in the the administration resilience is something that, as a, as a public policy person, you think a lot about how do the how do you help these communities become more resilient in the face of a natural disaster or human or human created, and how do you bounce back more quickly? And in the core infrastructure elements like transportation, transportation, housing are are the most vital. Yeah, um, most of our ideas actually um, comes from our community, from our hosts directly. Uh, we're still a pretty small company, but we have a large. A very smart community uh, and a community that cares. So during uh, Hurricane Sandy, we got a phone call uh, from a host in New York. It was not travel season. She had space, and she said, "I don't. I'm I'm available, but I and I want to host other New Yorkers for free." And back then, uh, Airbnb had a minimum of ten dollars uh, per night as a price, so we had to change that. So we had to make the like the change the technology also waive our fees because obviously we don't want to earn anything uh, during disasters, uh, but then also promote all those um, listings of hosts in New York um, that wanted to host others for free. Um, and we finally also made it into announcement of the mayor actually uh, spelled Airbnb pretty cutely um, so that everybody who was looking for space um, could find it. Um, and then we, because this, this was like a 24 hour thing where we had to, yeah. Uh, turn it around and it worked actually um, and, and uh, our host hosted uh, hundreds of other New Yorkers um, and then we realized this is not a one-time thing this could actually be helpful uh, we got the credit from from the city um, and our community really cared about this so what are other uh, similar situations around the world uh, natural disasters and floods where we actually have the direct contact to our hosts and guests um, when there is something happening, we can amplify or just share the messaging of many emergency management bureaus around the world that we've now partnered with um, to make sure uh, the right people know it at the right time. Um, then we started engaging into preparedness training, so working with NGOs like the Red Cross on uh, earthquake um, preparedness training. One thing that I 
uh, personally participated when I moved to, the, to this area of the world, um, <laughs> to be a better prepared host, to be a leader in, in the neighborhood as well. Um, but then also um, the response like, Sandy, um, how and when do we decide to open, ask our hosts to open their homes uh, and make it available to, to stranded guests um, or actually other locals who are in need of housing. And this has now become, from an idea stemming from the community, has become now a team um, uh, that works together whenever situations like this happen. So cool. That's very cool. Great. Let's open it up to questions from y'all. We've got time for, for a couple. Um, there are. Do we, should I have, and if you have a question, um, go ahead and come up to the mic. All right, well, I'm going to ask the first one from the audience then. I was just going to say, can I say something oh, yeah, off of what she said? Yeah. I think there's something like really interesting on that notion of community and organic. Like, we're trying to learn a lot from Airbnb. Um, and it's interesting, like, when we've seen some drivers in our community who are doing things like, Drivers were voluntarily like doing Meals on Wheels. They were voluntarily like doing interesting things with seniors or those from the accessibility community. And so I, I think one of the other things that's surprising, you know, when you nurture a community, when you treat people in a way that like values humanity and brings technology to humanity, incredible things can happen. Um, and so we're trying to actually take some of the learnings from our colleagues at Airbnb and see like what other things can we be doing you know, from a, from a community perspective. We can't necessarily do a lot of the disaster. Uh, we actually thought about it, but then we were like, oh my God, if like a tornado hits, do we actually want Lyft drivers out driving? What can we do in emergency preparedness situations? But I do think it's interesting, like with, the on, with certain, certain on-demand economy companies, um, that notion of having this community and people who actually really care about the community, um, and what do you do with that? Beyond just like having them sign petitions and, and call elected officials. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just jump in and say, putting my eBay alumni hat on, you know, that that notion was so central to the way that company kind of came into its own. Um, I was shocked to arrive there from a public policy background and find a company that regularly held uh, town hall meetings with live Q&A with executives um, and just an opportunity for people who would previously have been sort of you know, the customer or, you know, the workforce placed behind some kind of a veil, really to have that lifted and um, to, to think about what a community-based business looks like. It's a, it's a different kind of thing. And I think some of that has, has really kind of come through um, into a lot of the on-demand economy businesses. And, you know, I think the ones sitting with us today have been extremely successful at that. And that's part of why they've been so successful in the market as well. Um, Mike, you mentioned that you know, ten years ago we never would have, uh, if somebody had, had explained the Lyft business, to us, we, ne we never would have believed it was going to be successful. Um, and, and now you know you guys are are, are everywhere. Um, thinking about putting your, you know as as uh, somebody speaking to a, a room full of uh, future leaders in in these businesses and ones we can't even anticipate. Are there any sort of around the corner issues that you think that we not, nobody's thinking about now, or at least not not well, and that in five years or 10 years, we will be uh, we'll front and center for us. Right, so I think, you know, when I, I came out here from DC, uh, it'll be two years in May, and I think there was this notion that like, DC is like this far off place, and like, we don't know what they're doing. We're here in Silicon Valley, like, we're the innovators, we're the disruptors. I actually think there's gonna be a shift where I think Silicon Valley is now realizing that like, we have to figure out how to collaborate with DC. And it's beyond, just like the Apple encryption issue. It's beyond like the sharing economy. I think this is like health tech, right? Like I don't know how many of you here have heard of CRISPR, but like, oh my God, like that's mind blowing. It's gonna be like serious policy, <laughs> regulatory, ethical issues to deal with. And they're gonna have to be dealt with like in collaboration with government, right? Like ed tech, the future of education is unbelievable. The technology, the technological advancements in education are unbelievable. You're gonna have to collaborate with government on that. And I think it goes anywhere from like fintech to like energy. All these new emerging industries I think are fascinating, but these are also industries that are going to have to figure out how to collaborate with government if the consumers are going to reap the best benefits possible. So I think, look, there's a lot of stuff that's right around the corner that, that are happening faster than I can imagine. I think CRISPR is like one of them. But I think broadly speaking, that notion of having that understanding of how business interacts with government and how policy and government relations teams work closely with like, 
product development teams is one that I think we're going to see an explosion of in the next few years. Yeah. Right. Kylie, what about you? Um, I think when I started working for Airbnb, my parents couldn't really pronounce the name and have never heard of it. And previously, I also went to business school, so kind of took a huge loan to pay for it and then uh, go for work someone that no one knows and no one really believed in whether it's working. And now, well, actually last year, so four years later, uh, my parents, uh, now retired, have become Airbnb hosts. Um, I encouraged them just to, so that they would clean up the house a little bit. Um, they live very remotely, so I didn't think anyone would go there and sleep in, in my bedroom. Um, but they did. Like Their first guests were two businessmen from Australia. My dad is a retired English teacher. Um, I, he told me, super proud, that they talked um, super long over breakfast. They almost missed their business meeting, which was in another village with like 300 um, citizens. And they, were, they went there all the way from Australia for, uh, to look into a company that is very innovative around solar panels. So that's kind of really bringing the world together and like the change from like, what are you doing now and who is this? Um, to now, actually, my dad constantly also sends me like articles <laughs> uh, when Airbnb is in the news in Germany and like follows it. Perfect, perfect. Libby, what about you? Yeah, I think you know, sitting here at Haas, you know, I would definitely echo what Mike said, which is, you know, I, th I think listening to the stories we've heard today and the others that we've heard through the process we've been through over the last year or so, you know, it does seem as though um, understanding how to collaborate with across sectors generally um, is, is critical today and is going to be even more critical tomorrow. So for those of you who are thinking about you know, next year or next semester, um, thinking about uh, coursework or um, internship opportunities, things that will help you to build those skills seem like they would be really valuable um, and, and help to distinguish you and distinguish the Haas grad in general. Um, I think sitting on a university campus as well, the other thing that I would say is, you know, a lot of the visions of the future of work have us moving you know, even further away from full-time employment than we have today. Um, it has work sort of looking much more uh, like a series of tasks that you do with a number of different um, income providers. And that has serious implications for what we need to emerge from school knowing how to do. Um, you know, it needs, we need to think a lot harder about financial literacy and the way that we understand personal financial management. We need to uh, think differently about how we self-promote and market ourselves um, if we're going to be sort of uh, a, a company of one. Um, and we, we need to also think about how we improve people's risk appetite uh, because there may not be sort of the comfort and the stability of full-time employment moving forward. Uh, so you know, I, I think there are questions for a university, questions for cities about what that means kind of in an educational system context. Um, that I think will be big, important ones to wrestle with moving forward. That's awesome. Um, oh, we, got, we have a question. I do one <laughs> come back, and then we're going to um, turn it over to. The oh yeah, come on up. Can you hear me if I just we, for the for the people that are? We need to capture you for posterity. Exactly. <laughs> Can't just be a faceless voice. Yes. This is only a little awkward. Um, <laughs> uh, Michael, you spoke about the importance of engagement between Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. I was interested to learn a little bit more about the importance of engagement between Silicon Valley and uh, on-demand companies in Beijing and New Delhi and Nairobi and how you think about tailoring your policy efforts to emerging markets as um, on-demand companies increasingly expand internationally. So to put a finer point on it, what are sort of two or three of the top policy considerations that are on your mind, Kadi and Michael, as you're expanding into new geographies? Yeah, so look, for us, we, we made a strategic decision to, to enter into a partnership. So in China, we have a partnership with Didi Kwadi, right? And just to give you like an understanding of the scale, so we're doing a couple million rides a week. Didi's doing seven million rides a day. Yeah. So, they have like 90% of the market share. I mean, if you think about, for those who have been to like Beijing, I mean, Beijing is struggling with massive transportation issues, incredible congestion, like environmental issues, like no other country I think is dealing with, except for maybe India, right? And so, yes, there's incredibly complicated transportation policies there. And the reason why we ended up partnering for a number of reasons, but one of which is incredibly complex from a government relations perspective to be able to go in and do business in a place like China, we did a similar deal with Ola in India, right? In India, it's, 
like I don't know if anyone here has, has uh, experience in dealing with the Indian government, but it's not just like the federal government, it's not just the provincial government, it's not just the municipal government. There's like factions even within cities of having to, to do business. And so, yeah, working with a local partner like that to be able to cut through some of the GR hurdles has been incredibly important for us. And then we did another partnership with Grab Taxi for Southeast Asia. I think with an eye towards the future, honestly, I think a lot of these other countries are ahead of the game in terms of self-driving cars. They want to be the ones to like come out with the best pilots so that their cities can be on the forefront because their cities are dealing with congestion in a way that's even bigger than our cities are dealing with. And so that's why like the conversations that are happening in DC, like the Senate and NHTSA at DOT are kind of like under the pump to figure out what the regulations can and should be in the US so we can like win in this industry, make those cars here, have the regulations in place before like we get beat by some of these other developing countries who I would argue like are already thinking about that. Kadi, what about you? Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with what you just said. Um, we recently opened um, Airbnb uh, in Cuba after we were allowed to enter the market. Um, and that was actually only possible because we built on something existing. Um, so in Cuba, home sharing has been a common thing, uh, has developed over decades. Um, and it was not organized through an app um, or the Airbnb ecosystem. Um, so we tapped into uh, very hospitable people who were uh, very willing to host others. Um, and now we provide uh, those Cubans the technology for that so that they can host actually now people from all over the world more easily. Um, but in many places in the world where we, we are entering the market, um, the market is already there. Um, people are familiar with it, um, but we try to do the right thing by actually taking a local approach and either partnering or hiring local talent um, inside and maybe some consultants as well and listening to our local community there. They're always in any market where we start. There are always a few first hosts uh, who are really the front runners uh, who we work with closely and sometimes we end up hiring them. They're, they're now employees at Airbnb. Um, because they were part of the community or are still part of the community, but those are just our best allies in, in anywhere in the world. Yeah. And we do have time if you want to ask your question, go for it. We have the exact same question. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to add a part B to that. Um, so you talk a lot about communities in developing countries, and uh, so my question was how do you identify your stakeholders in these particular communities beyond just hosts and drivers? There are other stakeholders in place, and these are very different cultures with very intricate values. So I mean, what are some of the strategies that, that you are thinking when you're looking at stakeholders in these communities? Yeah, I think we should I go for it. We can think that uh, pretty broadly. Um, if you think about a host, a host might either be the homeowner or is a tenant, then a stakeholder is the landlord as well. Uh, if they live in an HOA, then stakeholders are other people who are in the same H HOA. If they have neighbors, neighbors are stakeholders. Uh, if they have a lot of small businesses that they refer their Airbnb guests to, those people are stakeholders. So this is really actually the community. Um, and Airbnb tourism touches, uh, touches um, a lot of different uh, stakeholders and players. And we actually do those town halls too. Mm -hmm. We go out to the community. We regularly give back. Actually, Airbnb allows um, every employee around the world to have four hours a month for volunteering. Um, and everyone can choose their own uh, cause that they want to support. Um, so by those um, uh, efforts, we're also really connected with NGOs and, and, and the communities that those serve. But basically, it's, it's so broad that it's an ecosystem where, where you can't really <laughs> define who is a stakeholder. It's not yeah. it's like everyone who lives in a city. Yeah. That's right. I'll give just two examples. So one is the, the broader accessibility, disability. Community right transportation is a massive pain point, not just for those who need wheelchair accessible vehicles, right, but for those who are blind, for those who have developmental disabilities. And organically, what we saw was that like the, the, the notion of, of a, blind, uh, a blind woman in Minnesota who came organically and testified about how Lyft had completely changed her life. She used to have to pre-book rides. She didn't know if the car was gonna come or not. The experience was terrible. Now you've got this on-demand, cashless, transaction with someone who comes and is nice and friendly. It's been life-changing for her and for, I think, people across that accessibility, disability space. And they've become incredible stakeholders 
in not only teaching us how to grow as a company and develop our app and whatnot, but also just explaining to stakeholders, to policymakers and political officials how important having ride sharing is and how it's changed their lives. The other is seniors, right? So we have a number of like retirees who are drivers who love it because of the flexibility and because they like love talking to people and also they're like some of our top rated drivers because they don't need the GPS. They actually like know where they're going, right? Yeah. <laughs> like for real. Uh, and then on the other hand, right, there's a lot of uh, population that can't drive anymore. And only 20% of people 65 and older have smartphones. So we have this new concierge system where people can call and it's a digital dispatch system. But I think it's something like 72 million people are gonna be over the age of 65 by 2030. Like the senior space is I think gonna be a huge business opportunity for us. That notion of, again, we talked about like humanity and technology and transportation being so personal. Um, that, that segment, that, that group of stakeholders have been, I think, incredible for us from a business perspective. I think they're gonna be a bigger part of the business. And also from an advocacy perspective, um, you know, it's like you have this mean city council person that you have like a nice over that kind of talks about their experience as Lyft drivers. Like, <laughs> come on, <laughs> right? So those two groups have been, have been great stakeholders. Awesome, all right. Well, thank you guys. Um, I feel like one of the things I heard from the, the, the panelists today is um, for future business leaders, understanding policy and, and policy making and where that happens is certainly incredibly important. And for those of you who are here on the policy side, that there's a huge opportunity um, in these regulated spaces to understand that better. And that for many of you may mean spending some time in Washington, DC. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Tyson to come up, one of, uh, one of my, my favorites and folks who have um, spent time both out here in the business community uh, man in Washington and has given uh, endless amounts of her time to, to multiple administrations in DC. So thank you for that and uh, we'll get some closing. So I'm gonna say very little. One question we could have asked you uh, is, uh, so talking about regulation in these very new parts of the economy, regulation around the world, there may be people in this room who say, why should we have any? I mean, what, what, what's the point? of The regulation is all a barrier. So I think one of the key things for the future work initiative and for the companies, and you're hearing it directly from the companies, is when to figure out when is the existing regulation appropriate. That is, it's dealing with a real issue. Maybe the real issue is the accessibility of impaired individuals to have public transportation. That's a public yep. issue. Uh, we have rules around it. So the, I, I think in a way I would say think about where why do we have rules already in the existing sort of uh, infrastructure and how do they have to change and do they have to disappear altogether or are they reformulated? You've heard from two companies here today who are I think very much embracing the notion that you have to have a dialogue with the regulators and you have to figure out modern new regulators. But I will not say that that in general characterizes all companies and all new companies. So I just want to start with that. Uh, I want to point out an interesting thing that people worry about in this space that the apps become so powerful that there's a lot of market power. So I'm not thinking about this as an economist for a minute. A lot of market power from the companies. All these individual task providers, they have no power vis-a-vis -vis the companies or that would be the concern. So the, the, the market power of the app provider, the platform provider, and where do those returns go? So one of the things that struck me in listening to the importance of communities is sort of how, what's the right governance structure for a company like Lyft? A company like Lyft could reasonably be a profit sharing company. It could be a collectively owned company. It could be basically all, no, it's, just, it's just to think about <laughs> what is the appropriate governance structure because that's a lot of what the Center for Corporate Social Responsibility thinks about is governance of an organization. So I just want to, because right now I would say one of the key issues that economists are worried about in the whole tech space is the incredible market power of a very small number of providers. And that is market power vis-a-vis -vis the consumers, but they tend to be giving things at low prices to consumers, but massive market power vis-a-vis -vis the providers. So that's a, a question that I would sort of put out there for future thought. Um, one of the things that uh, I think that Libby really did a great uh, summary of all of the concerns, particularly pronounced in the US, not so much in Europe, certainly not so much in the Scandinavian parts of Europe, the concerns that so much of our benefit structure in the US has traditionally been through employment. So we do not have anywhere near the social protections uh, that exist in 
the Scandinavian countries, in France. I mean, to mention a non-Scandinavian company with a lot of protections. So as we're moving more and more of the economy in this direction, that's what a lot of people are concerned about. Well, how do we come up with a new set of, what, what is the appropriate safety net, number one? And number two, how is it delivered? It's not going to be delivered anymore through the employment relationship. How is it going to be delivered? I think that's a very, very important fundamental question going forward. And for those who, who th let me reverse that, there was a kind of interesting uh, book that came out about six months ago called Raw Deal. And what that author said, he's a former uh, member of the, uh, I think the uh, New America Foundation. Uh, he said, look, the problem right now is that if you take the benefit structure we have in traditional employment relationships and you cost that out, there's a huge incentive for a company to actually independent contract as much as they possibly can because you actually can reduce the cost of the work by about a 30%. So if you think about UC Berkeley, you hire somebody, you put on all the benefits, it's 30 for 40% more than the take home pay of the person. So when you're costing it from the University of California at Berkeley, you're saying, well, couldn't I outsource this somehow? I mean, what? <laughs> so there's a huge incentive based in our system in particular. We are extreme in this, I think, the US, to encourage employers to move out of traditional employment relationships to independent contractors. And I just want to put that in the context of what just happened here in the state of California. So we're going to move to a minimum wage of $15 an hour. I applaud that. I absolutely applaud that. But as we move in that direction, to what extent will employers say, I want to think of a way not to have to do this. Is there some way I can use an app or something that doesn't require me to have an employer, an employee? And therefore, the minimum wage doesn't apply to me. There's no minimum wage for an independent contractor. It is whatever the independent contractor can negotiate with the person who is employing him or her. So those are just some of the public policy issues. You have some brilliant, wonderfully motivated, great companies here who are dealing with this completely seriously in a community-based way. I completely applaud you. And everybody who's interested in this should be also involved in working with the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative because really this is the beginning of what is going to be a very long process of redesigning the social contract in the United States uh, to fit the gig economy, the on-demand economy, the sharing economy, the community-based economy. So thank you very much, guys. It was terrific. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Laura.